Blood's just this guy, you know? Written by Nemo Specific. Performed by Chinchillax. Everyone has their reasons. So what could possibly make a pony act like Blue Blood did at the gala? Every chapter will explore a new explanation for just what was going on that night. Explanation number one. With a special guest star, Ringer as Blue Blood. Rut. Rut, rut, rut. Blue Blood was at a sidewalk cafe, watching the ponies of Canterlot go by and trying not to think about the night ahead. He was poised to fall into a rut, and it was the same one every year. It was the day of the Grand Galloping Gala, and Blue Blood shuddered just to think of it. It was the same tedious affair every year, with the same slow music, same tiny appetizers, and the exact same sea of gossiping dilettantes. He'd actually given up all pretense and had asked Auntie if he could skip it this year, but she smiled that inscrutable smile of hers and had mentioned how disappointed she'd be if she didn't see him around during the evening. Practically an imperial decree to attend, then. Blue Blood blew a strand of mane out of his face with a sigh. He honestly did not know how Auntie put up with it. He'd only been attending the gala for about eight years, and it was already bad enough for him to consider running away to Appaloosa just to avoid it. Last year, it had only been joining the circus. Shaking his head, Blue Blood knew he'd do what he always did. Show up late, stick close to Auntie, then sneak out early and spend the rest of the evening at Pony Joe's. It wasn't perfect, but he couldn't let Auntie down, could he? A flash of green caught his eyes, and Blue Blood perked up. Skipping Stone! They were always good for a laugh. If they went together, the gala might be bearable, at least. Blue Blood started waving to the green pony and almost called out before realizing that it wasn't his dear friend Skippy, but a complete stranger. Main and cutie mark aside, the resemblance was amazing. Chuckling at himself, Blue Blood sat back down and made a note to hunt up Skippy after tea. Going to the gala together still had merit, and if nothing else, they'd be amused at how Blue Blood had almost made a fool of himself waving at a stranger who happened to look... just... like... Blue Blood could barely contain his glee as the idea struck him. It might work. If he could pull it off. Why, this might be the best night ever. Your Highness, you want me to... What? Ringer stared up at the prince. Please, please, call me Blue Blood. I mean, I'm not that much taller than you, Blue Blood said of the chuckle. It was true that the Earth Pony Stallion was a few inches shorter than the prince, but he already knew he could work around that. I saw you at the off bridal way performance of the Prancing Prince. I know you can do this, Ringer winced. You, uh, saw that, sir? Blue Blood slapped Ringer on the back and laughed louder. Saw it? I saw it nearly every night it ran. It was hilarious. Noticing Ringer's pained look, the prince just smiled. Oh, relax. Seriously, I know satire when I see it. And if a pony can't laugh at his own foibles, he deserves to be taken down a notch. And really, Blue Blood is fine. No titles, no honorifics. Ringer took a deep breath and tried to let go of the stress. The tension of standing next to and talking with the prince the very important and very influential unicorn that he'd spent three months lampooning on stage, mocking and whining and wheedling and portraying him as the most self-absorbed, stuck-up, vain, glorious, oh no, he's going to have Celestia send me to the moon and I'll never see an audience again and I'll die and... Blue Blood grew increasingly worried as Ringer just stared at him and started to hyperventilate. Ringer? Ringer? Do you need a bag or something? Oh, please don't banish me to the moon! I swear I'll never act again! I'll work for the Diamond Docks, and I'll, my, and I'll work in a mine, and I'll be underground where no one can see me, and I'm sorry! Get a hold of yourself! Blue Blood shook the panicky actor and stared at him in the eyes. It's okay, I thought it was funny! I want you to do me a favor. No one's going to the moon. Really? Blue Blood patted Ringer gently and gave him a few moments to settle down. He still kept an eye on him for any warning signs that he'd have another fit, though. When no attack seemed forthcoming, Blue Blood cleared his throat. As you know, the Grand Galloping Gala is tonight, and as a member of the royalty and nephew to the princess, I'm expected to make a showing. What you may not know is that it's soul-crushingly boring, and if given a choice between a thousand years on the moon or going to the gala twice in a row, I'd pick the moon. And you want me to go? I thought you said you liked the Prancing Prince, Ringer huffed. 
Good, Blue Blood thought. He's finally relaxing. Took him long enough. Not just go. Go as me. I want you to take my place and pretend to be me for the whole evening. Think of it as research. You can see all the knobs of Equestria hobnobbing and being all knobby. Plenty of material for your next satire. And you can impress everyone when we reveal that you fooled everyone. Agents will be breaking down the door to get the actor who fooled the entire upper crust for a whole evening with no intermissions. Also, well, I'd appreciate it. I know I'm asking a lot of you at the last minute, but I would be incredibly grateful if you do this for me. Ringer looked over the prince. No, the pony before him, and considered. Blue Blood was right, of course. Most of his material was gleaned from the tabloids and scandal sheets. Seeing first hoof all the passions and eccentricities of the elite of Equestria could give him enough to work with for half a dozen new plays. But there was no way he could do it. But the chance to show off his skill at impersonation, not just with those who went to the gala, but everyone who heard about it afterwards? He couldn't get better publicity if Luna herself put his cutie mark on the moon. Maybe he could do it. It was the hopeful look on Blue Blood's face that decided Ringer. For all that he'd made a joke of the stallion for three months, with all the rehearsals and pratfalls and sly winks about his foppishness. After talking with him for half an hour, Ringer was just struck by how nice he was. He wasn't perfect, and had a sense of entitlement that could only come from being royalty, but he was friendly, outgoing. He tried his best to do right by other ponies. He was a genuinely warm and caring soul. Probably gets it from his aunt. I'll do it. Even though he was an earth pony and only slightly shorter than the prince, Ringer was still tackled off his hooves by the flying hug Blue Blood gave him. I wondered how you passed for me on stage. Blue Blood looked over the closet of makeup and dyes as Ringer put the finishing touches on his costume. Coat and mane, powdered and dyed, check. Fake horn, check. Lifts in his shoes, check. Cutie mark copied, hmm, the left one was a bit crooked. Ringer grumbled as he cleaned his flank off and started over on the fake cutie mark. Blue Blood peered down at a bucket of cadmium number 37? That didn't sound healthy. Honestly, I'd been thinking it was some form of illusion and sat through a few shows trying to spot who was casting it for you. Still focused on trying to paint a straight line on his own side without smudging, Ringer said distractedly, That's what everyone says. No one appreciates just what you can get done with real, practical effects. Ringer switched to a mocking sing-song voice. Oh, you can do anything with magic. Why would you ever want to go to the fuss and trouble of doing anything for real? (sighs) Do you know what happens when you're in the presence of an ongoing spell for, oh, say, two or more hours? Blue Blood looked up and shook his head. Your horn starts tingling. For a pegasus, their wings get itchy. For us earth ponies, our bones get warm. Something about the constant pressure of the magic, just... It's impossible not to notice. For any pony. It's bad enough just by itself. But for the audience, it just takes them out of the story. I've seen a bunch of plays, really good plays, flop at the box office because they relied too heavily on magical effects. Huh. So rather than have a unicorn off stage, you do... This? Blue Blood waved a hoof at the room they were in crammed with all manner of paints, brushes, sponges, masks, prosthetic corns and wings, wigs, and a couple of fake noses. Ringer stuck his tongue out and put the finishing touch on his new compass rose. Gone was the average-sized gray and tan earth pony with two not-quite-identical bells for his mark. Now there was a tall, white and blonde unicorn with perfectly straight compasses. Yep, I mean, magic has its place in the theater, don't get me wrong. Quick changes, momentary special effects, scene changes. But for costumes and props, it's got to be real. The audience can tell if something doesn't hang right, or seem to have any weight, or (laughs) listen to me lecturing like a teacher. Any downsides? Well, yeah, but they're manageable. If I get wet, the cutie mark will run. I have to be careful about what I touch, or I'll get makeup on it. And these lifts, ugh. Ringer showed Blue Blood the shoe he was wearing that brought him up to eye level with the prince. They ruin my grip. I can barely hold anything. I can't even open a door with them on. You said the gala is going to be mostly in open halls, right? Yes, you should be fine. Oh, I can hardly wait. Ringer kept watching and listening to Blue Blood, 
observing how he stood and spoke and making adjustments to his mental image of the stallion. The night would essentially be one long improv exercise, but he'd still have to stay in character. So what are you going to be doing while the gala's going on? Get out of town. Everything shuts down for the gala, and I'm in the mood for a real party. I've heard good things about... Oh, what is it called? It's right outside Canterlot. Uh, Auntie sent her student there. It's by the Everfree. Auntie Luna went there when she came back from the moon. Ponyville? I've performed there a few times. Yes, thank you. I've heard there's a mayor there who throws simply the best parties around. Fun and games, and friends. She even makes all the snacks herself. Out of the bakery she works at. Oh, I'm looking forward to it. Ringer can keep from laughing at how the normally dignified unicorn was practically bouncing with excitement. You can do this. You can do this. You can do this. Ringer took another lungful of cool garden air and tried to calm down. It was just opening night jitters. The gala was going to start in just a few minutes. He would start mingling and everything would be fine. He didn't have any lines to forget or marks to miss. He just had to smile and watch and try to make everyone think he was the most handsome, eligible unicorn stallion in Canterlot, and he'll never fool anyone, they'll all laugh, and then the princesses will fight over sending him to the moon or the sun, and... and hair pulling? Wings flared? Hmm. Ringer shook his head as his panic attack managed to derail itself in something that was at least ungentle coldly and probably sacrilegious. He looked back at the main hall and noticed a stunning vision of beauty enter the garden. Her dress, her tiara, her mane. Ringer felt certain that if she talked to him, he'd gabble some nonsense and promptly pass out in shame. She was divine. Perfection. A mare fit for a king. Or a prince, he realized. Ringer might not have a chance with her, but Blue Blood might. He approached the angelic unicorn as she was sniffing a rose and delivered the suavest, most elegant opening line ever to be uttered in the pursuit of romance. Well, hello. I am Prince Blue Blood. Ah, uh, no, 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 of course I'm Blue Blood. Everyone knows Blue Blood. He's the prince for Celestia's sake. I am the dumbest stallion ever. I should banish myself to the moon. His face locked in a rictus grin. Ringer could barely believe it as the goddess before him simply introduced herself in return, before commenting on the flower she'd been looking at. Oh my, what a lovely rose. You mean, this rose? What do I do? What would Blue Blood do? No, no, stop. Breathe, breathe, think, think fast. Should I give it to her? Am I mad? A bright red rose with that dress? I might as well throw wine on her. But she must know that, so... Uh, Aha! Deftly using his mouth, since his hooves would only have crushed the flower in the lifts he was wearing, Ringer bit the stem off the rose and slipped it into the buttonhole of the formal collar he was wearing. Thank you. It goes with my eyes. That's what she meant for it, right? I, I mean, she's perfect. A rose for her would be like... like gilding a lily. No, she must have meant it for me. An accent to brighten me up. Dear Celestia, I feel so plain next to her. I must be the ugliest stallion at the gala for her to take pity on me like this. The evening wore on, far better than Blue Blood had made it sound. Then again, Ringer was looking around him and could see satires and comedies of manners riding themselves for him, and not a bunch of passing acquaintances he'd have to remember at the next garden party. Simply a matter of perspective, he supposed. The angel at his side didn't hurt either. The lifts, however, were wearing on him far worse than he'd expected. He'd worn them for plays before, but he'd been able to slip them off between scenes and stretch his legs a bit. It had only been about an hour since the gala started, and already his hooves were killing him. How mares do it, I'll never know. She's been walking with me the entire time in those pointy glass things, and acts like she's wearing nothing at all. As they made their way into the corner of the garden set aside for conversation and stargazing, Ringer couldn't believe it. Not only had she noticed that he was getting tired, but she'd been guiding him to one of the last available cushions? She must be the living definition of generosity. With a barely suppressed sigh of relief, he settled down on the cushion to get some feeling back in his hooves. As the evening grew more chill, 
Ringer and his... Date? Do I dare claim one so... So amazing as my date? Returned to the main hall. And immediately almost got himself killed. With a cry of her name and a hoof to save her, Ringer cried out, Stop! Oh, Prince Blue Blood, how chivalrous! It didn't matter that it wasn't his name. The way she said it to him made his heart race. He glared down at the puddle before them. Water? On marble? A pony could break their neck, especially me in these stupid lifts. One would hate to slip. I can repay her for finding me that cushion in the garden and giving me this wonderful rose. Yes, one certainly would. That laugh, like a sweet bell. It seemed to cut through an invisible cloud that had been building out in the garden. One's cloak should take care of the problem. Even as he said it, Ringer heard what he was saying and screamed at himself to stop. I don't have a cloak! I don't have any clothes! No, no, no! That sounds like I expect her to mop it up with her dress! No one's that crass! What is wrong with me? What have I done? The moon's too good for me. I should see if I can find the gates of Tartarus and... Oh, who am I kidding? They wouldn't let someone as horrible as me in there. His mind totally locked up. Ringer could only blink a few times, not hearing what the mare said. He didn't snap out of it until it was too late, and that wonderful, amazing mare had already thrown her cloak down and nudged him forward. What have I done? What have I done? I can't even look at her now. What is wrong with me? A door? Why is there a closed door here? Why do we have to go through it? Stupid, stupid lifts. Stupid me, stupid door. Ah! Okay, okay, okay. You can do this, Ringer. You've completely ruined everything up till now, so you can at least try to go out with some dignity. Chin up, eyes closed, face forward. If you don't touch anything, you can't break anything. If you don't say anything, you can't insult her. If you can make it through the rest of the night, in the morning you can petition the princesses to send you to the moon and the sun. At the same time. Somehow. They can do that. They're princesses. By this point in the evening, Ringer was nearing a fugue state. He was locked in a mental loop of berating himself for not thinking, and unable to think of anything else. His actions were becoming more and more automatic, as he fell back on the habits he'd formed during the run of the Prancing Prince. Which worked fine until they got to the food cart. Strapped to a meteor and flung out to the deepest reaches of space. But no, there might be some beauty in that, and that's more than I deserve. Maybe they can... Oh, hey, apples! Man, if only I'd had some pockets, I'd... <clears throat> Wait. <clears throat> Was that... Was that my throat? Did I just clear my throat back there? No, 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 again? <clears throat> I, but she... No, no, this is... This, 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 is, this isn't right! And with a sad little... Ringer curled up inside his own head and started sobbing, as the satire of Blue Blood he'd performed over months of rehearsals and performances took over in the worst possible way. Blech, uh, fritters, dumplings, caramel apples, my royal lips have touched common carnival fare. I'm going to the buffet for some hors d'oeuvres. If Ringer could see himself right then, he would have bucked himself hard enough to knock his cutie mark off. The nose in the air the way he enunciated carnival and hors d'oeuvres. It was a perfect prancing prince, and a gross betrayal of the blue blood he'd met this afternoon. Isn't right. Ringer had a couple of minutes to come back to himself as he stared at the door to the hall with the buffet. He had nothing else to do while he waited for someone to open the door for him, after all. It was only after thinking about how much he'd started to hate the lifts that he realized he could form a coherent thought again. A few thoughts about sneaking off to find the highest balcony in the castle later, and he was almost ready to beg for forgiveness. From anyone, really. He had no right to be picky at this point. For some reason, he couldn't possibly fathom. Some expression of infinite mercy and patience beyond mortal pony. His not-a-date never could have been a date. Why did I ever hope companion for the evening arrived and opened the door for him, again, like he should have been doing. Still unwilling to break character, though, he marched forward into the hall and was given one last chance to prove himself worthy. 
For some reason he couldn't possibly fathom, some expression of unbounded enthusiasm and excitement beyond mortal pony. A lunatic had launched themselves off the stage and slammed their chin into a cart and catapulted a ridiculously large cake directly at... He could see it. He could see exactly how it would play out. The cake coming down, spattering all over that magnificent dress, ruining her mane. No, no, if nothing else, Ringer could do this. She could slap him afterwards for grabbing her like that, but he would save her from that cake. It was the absolute least he could do, after mistreating her the whole evening. Ringer leapt into action, swiftly pulling the mare out of the way, and finding out he had completely misjudged the trajectory. He had just pulled her into the path of the cake. Into. With a much louder... Ringer lost what little grip on sanity he'd recovered waiting at the door and began babbling. <laughs> Stay back! I just had myself groomed! After that, things became a bit of a blur for the poor actor. There was shouting, and... and things falling. There was definitely things falling, and animals. Wait, that couldn't have been right. Where would animals have come from? When the dust had settled and he stopped babbling... All Ringer knew was that he'd somehow managed to make it back to his dressing room without being trampled by anyone. Ringer nursed his head. After carefully removing the fake horn, he'd spent the next two hours alternating between getting the dye out of his coat and banging his head on the wall. Now he just wanted to drown his sorrows at the local donut shop and wake up tomorrow with a massive sugar hangover. The bell over the door rang, but was drowned out by the laughter of of oh dear celestia wait no she's here too ringer slowly backed out of pony joe's and didn't start whimpering until he was a block away and once i got there no one could tell me where she was a few ponies thought she'd gone to the gala but that doesn't make any sense why would anyone who likes parties want to go to the gala it'd be like loving the sea and living on a mountain or loving apples and growing pears it's just crazy Still, I met some nice ponies and made a few new pen pals. Really, Ponyville is just so incredibly friendly. I really must visit it again sometime. Oh, but enough about my night. How was yours, Ringer? Ringer just stared at the prince with hollow eyes and let out a single, choked sob. Ringer? Author's note. His full name is Dead Ringer, but he's terribly embarrassed by it. Wouldn't you be, with a first name like Dead? Explanation number two. Rank Prince. Code name Blue Blood. He was called Prince Blue Blood, and he was brushing his mane. It was the evening of the Grand Galloping Gala, after all. Prince indicated that he was the highest ranking unicorn stallion in service, answerable only to the princesses themselves. Technically, he outranked the duchess and barons but the nature of field work and espionage had shifted where the actual power lay in the last few centuries. Information assessment and correlation was far more vital than anything a lone pony could do. He'd already petitioned the princesses to have the titles updated, but tradition still said that a prince of the realm must go among the ponies. And so it was that only an active field agent could be prince. Blue blood signified his specialization, maneuvering through high society and blending in with the upper crust. He'd done his share of wet work, but he excelled at the soft touch, remembering names, faces, wines. For the longest time, it had been a post exclusive to unicorns. It was a sad but undeniable fact that only recently were the race barriers being cracked. Oh, earth ponies and pegasi are to be respected, certainly, but they have their place, you know. A flicker of distaste crossed his face at the thought, but he calmed himself by remembering that society moves ever forward, and there were fewer idiots with opinions on inherently stronger bloodlines 
or other drivel every year. He couldn't bring himself to hope that he could manage to get a zebra approved as his successor, but he had his high hopes for an earth pony cadet he'd been grooming. Blue Blood, the 53rd, might be hornless, and what a day that would be. Prince Blue Blood, the 52nd. It was ridiculous. Only unicorns could fall for such a thing, with their obsession with ancestors and lineage. No one batted to deny at more than 50 stallions, many of whom barely looked alike, all sharing the same name. The Earth Pony Division was far more sensible about it. Ponies got to keep their names, for one. Ranks were reflected by familial titles, in a way that made sense. The granny organized everything. Contacts were cousins, and you could always, always rely on a brother or sister to watch your flank. With their widespread network of clans and families, they could expect a safe house in every city and a friendly face at every train stop, with no one questioning that a pony just happened to have a relative from around there. The granny in charge made sure of it, in fact. Seeing one of their reunions in action, and the sheer amount of intel being shared, sifted and all of it in code, as family gossip, it made Blue Blood proud to be an equestrian. The Pegasi were the public face of Equestria's forces, even more so than the Royal Guards. Who hadn't heard of the Wonderbolts? There had been a time when Blue Blood had envied their straightforward hierarchy and actual names, but that had been a long time ago, and Blue Blood wasn't the colt he was then. Blue Blood ran the brush through his mane one last time and steeled himself. He was Prince Blue Blood. He had his mission. Tonight was the Grand Galloping Gala. He would make the princesses proud. Archduchess! Prince! The two unicorns are meeting in the trendiest cafe in Canterlot. Lots of exposure, ponies peering at them from every side, the occasional pop of a flashbulb from the less discreet tabloid photographers. It put his teeth on edge, but he was a professional and had a role to play. Prince Blueblood and Archduchess Whistle Wishes placed their orders and got down to gossiping. Will we be seeing you at the gala tonight? Something's come up. We have a mission for you at the gala. I wouldn't miss it for the world. Understood. Orders. Splendid. Are you seeing anyone these days? You're to meet a mayor at the party. Stay close and use your best judgment. Oh, trying to set me up on another blind date? How dangerous is this expected to be? And what's the description of the contact? You know me. Just a romantic at heart. But you'll like her, I swear. We don't expect much trouble, but it could get bad. Intel was only able to report that she's a white unicorn. Hmm, anyone I know? Do we know anything more? Now, now, I wouldn't want to ruin the surprise. No. Blue Blood smirked and shook his head, not saying anything. Despite a long and glorious history of rough ponies and military forthrightness, there weren't actually any code phrases for the swearing he wanted to do. I'll give you a hint, though. She calls herself Rarity, and she likes flowers. She'll identify herself as one of the elements of harmony, and will meet you in the gardens. Blue Blood winked at his handler and sipped his tea. Picking Rarity for the codename was quite clever. No pony in their right mind would dare pretend to be one of the national heroes. And from personal experience, he couldn't imagine anyone outside of Cantalot wanting to come to the gala. The thing was incredibly tedious, even for the most dedicated socialites. I look forward to meeting her. Acknowledged. The two ponies nodded to each other and enjoyed the rest of the afternoon amidst ponies none the wiser of what had taken place. Blue Blood scanned the garden. He'd spotted a few ponies who might be his contact as he passed through the main hall, but he knew better than to approach any of them outside of the arranged rendezvous spot. That way lay panic, screaming international incidents, and animal stampedes. So he waited and watched. There, by the roses, mare, unicorn, white coat. Normally he'd consider the tiara too much of an attention grabber for this sort of assignment, but then again, it was the gala. One year he'd seen no less than three mares balancing their dates on their backs for the entire evening. It had been both fashionably baffling and physically impressive. A pony could get away with anything this night. He made his approach and said the first half of the code. Well, hello. I am Prince Blue Blood. Without missing a beat, she gave the proper response. I am Rarity. 
Oh my, what a lovely rose. You mean, this rose? With the paranoia and consideration born of years of service in equestrian espionage, he picked the rose with his mouth rather than his magic. A bit of energy saved now could mean the difference between nine seconds of a forest beam or ten. Huh. Odd taste on the stem. As he started to offer rarity, the rose, something clicked and he realized just how badly the evening was going to get. Spicy. Undertones of orange. With a bitter aftertaste. I know this poison. Jerking the tainted flower away from the mare, he chewed off the rest of the stem. First things first. Don't put anyone else at risk. Not like I'm going to get any more poisoned at this point. Still, might keep it for evidence, he thought, and slipped the evidence into his collar. A quick look at the mare convinced him that she wasn't an assassin. She hadn't flinched away when he'd started to offer her the rose, and actually seemed hurt when he'd pulled it back. Looking at the bushes, he was sure that only the one rose had been poisoned. Honestly, how was I not suspicious of a single rose growing out of her forget-me-not bush? Ugh. He realized he hadn't said anything yet, and the mayor had to be told if she was going to be of any help. Thank you. It goes with my eyes. Since she'd known the sign and countersign phrases, Blue Blood hoped she was familiar with the standard SOS phrase for poisoning as well. His horn was throbbing. That wasn't a good sign, but at least it confirmed that he was right about what had been coded on the rose. After a quick word to a waiter, who he'd served with a few years ago in the Griffin Kingdom, Blue Blood was sure no other ponies would be getting close to those particular bushes for the rest of the gala. Speaking of other ponies, Blue Blood was starting to have second thoughts about the mare. Rarity didn't seem to have recognized the SOS phrase, but that wasn't conclusive. He'd made some small chat with her and slipped in a few code phrases, but her replies could have been pure coincidence or the work of a smooth professional. They had drifted off the path to a clearing set aside for couples. The lanterns had been purposefully left unlit for now, to encourage a mood of intimacy. It was still more exposed than he liked, but here at least no one would question the two of them not wishing to be overheard. As Blue Blood grabbed the last cushion and started to offer it to Rarity, he heard a quiet... His heart nearly stopped, and before she could move, he'd planted himself on the cushion and closed his eyes in concentration. If she said something, he didn't hear it, focused as he was on trying to disarm the bomb he was now sitting on. Stupid and sloppy, he berated himself. If I hadn't been positioning it with my mouth, I never would have heard the trigger arming itself. It must be the poison. It's affecting me more than I realized. Why would there only be one cushion left in the couple's section? I even thought it seemed heavy as I brought it over. Blue Blood, skilled as he was at multitasking, still had limits, so he continued to criticize himself, do extremely delicate telekinesis without using his eyes, while toxins continued to burn in his blood and completely failed to pay any attention to the mare next to him. It hadn't been easy, and using his magic had only made the throbbing in his horn worse, but he'd done it. I haven't had to disarm a bomb I was sitting on since that mission with the author and... and the weird blue... dog... thing. Eyes closed, breathing through his nose, Blue Blood tried to get his thoughts back in order. They started to drift after he'd plucked the rose, and it had only gotten worse from using magic. He knew what the poison was. He was sure of it. Even if he couldn't remember the name of it just at the moment, and it would take a few days before it would be fatal which gave him plenty of time to finish tonight's mission and get the cure. Well, unless... unless there was something. Something that reacted with the poison made it much worse. What, though, eluded him at the moment, much like the name of the poison. I need to figure out this mare. Who is she? If she's not my contact, I... What? Abandon her? I have to protect her. I have my duty. If she is my contact, can I trust her? Or is she the threat? Spying a puddle, Blue Blood decided to hit her with a string of code Rarity couldn't possibly luck her way through. Miss Rarity, stop! Standard code for I challenge your identity. Oh, Prince Blue Blood, how chivalrous! Hmm, given the situational context, that was the standard reply for I am your contact and I think we're being watched. 
one would hate to slip. I think the mission is getting too dangerous and wish to abort. Yes, one certainly would. We are aware of the risks, but believe it's a lone operator. The mission can be salvaged. One's cloak should take care of the problem. Challenge. How committed are you to the mission? Oh, of course it will. And with that, she covered the spill. Absolutely. Blue Blood was convinced. It wasn't just the words. The actions were just as important. The act of actually mopping up a puddle in the middle of the floor with a part of her dress. It was the textbook answer to the contextual code. No casual party-goer would ruin their clothes for someone they'd just met, or even stay with them after being asked to do such a thing. She must be his contact. He had to trust her. The symptoms were definitely getting worse. The throbbing in his horn was seriously disrupting his ability to focus his magic now. He'd lost feeling in his hooves, and his throat was starting to tighten up. Not enough to kill him. That was still days away but enough to make speaking painful. At least his memory was less muddled. The name of the poison was on the tip of his tongue now. They'd stopped at a door. Blue Blood was following the mare's lead now, but noticed that she was hesitating. He caught her eye and nodded his head at the door. Is this where we need to go? She nodded back. Affirmative. Blue Blood nodded twice, a grim look on his face. Do you expect trouble? Should we rush them? She scowled and nodded four times, rapidly. Negative. Keep following my lead and stay alert, but do not engage. Blue Blood drew back a bit at that. It had been a long time since he'd not been the lead in the field. I know relationships within the department are frowned upon, but I like this mayor. Lifting his chin in acknowledgement, Blue Blood smiled inside as she put on her game face and opened the door. He took point ready to intercept any attacks for her. There had been no attacks, and so they'd moved on and had wandered through the gardens again. Blue Blood kept an eye out for any ponies that were sticking a little too close. He knew the faces of most of the ponies attending, from this soiree or that fate, so he was able to focus on the newcomers. They'd finally made their way to a food cart run by one such newcomer, and, oh, an apple. Of course. Brilliant. Selling food won't raise suspicions about who approaches. She'll talk with everyone. It's a perfect way to gather and distribute intel in the field. Whoever (laughs) came up with this should be the next prince. (laughs) Blue Blood was so impressed by the idea that he missed what the mares had said to each other, some sign and countersign, with an inquiry on the last known whereabouts of their target, no doubt. As the apple placed a couple of fritters in front of them, Rarity coughed to get his attention. <clears throat> Throat still sore from the poison, he coughed back in acknowledgement. <clears throat> Apparently not loud enough. As she coughed at him and gave him a pointed look. <clears throat> not sure what else to do, he coughed louder <clears throat> as well. I heard you already. What do you want from me? Seeing the mares talk again, Blue Blood realized the poison was further along than he'd thought. He couldn't hear what was being said from two feet away. When the apple held out the fritters, though, Blue Blood figured it out. I was supposed to take the food. It would look suspicious if we left empty hoofed. Ugh, I'm off my game tonight. Seriously wondered if he'd misidentified the poison after all, and considered making a run for the infirmary. Blue Blood took a bite of the pastry and felt like he'd gotten a mouthful of wasps and fire. The pain was intense and instantly cleared his mind. Spitting out the flaky crust, the sugary apples, Blue Blood's mind raced. Fritters, dumplings, caramel apples. That was it. That was the connection. He needed to get inside. He had to act quickly. My royal lips have touched common carnival fare. I'm going to the buffet for some hors d'oeuvres. Hors d'oeuvres. That was her code name in the reports. They'd never been able to establish what her name really was, and someone had been feeling puckish when they'd assigned it to her. She was an extremist, who believed in total pastry disarmament. She'd written multiple manifestos, starting with a demand for bans on cakes, pies, and every other baked good being used in any and all equestrian conflicts. As the years had passed and the pies continued to fly, hors d'oeuvres had gotten more radical in her demands. Universal ban on fried foods, enforced dietary regimens for all citizens. 
violent punishment for any confectioners and chocolatiers. The first time she'd blown up a candy store had been when she was fourteen. It had only gotten worse from there. One of her trademarks was a poison that could simulate the symptoms of a bad cold. Headache, numbness, sore throat, stuffy head. The poor pony would either receive a get-well-soon cake from their friends, or when the symptoms went away a day later, they would go out and celebrate. And then explode. Twice. When the poison interacted with pastry, it became violently explosive. And Blue Blood had nearly swallowed a fritter. She was here, at the gala. She had to be. To set up the rose, the cushion, she must have been following him all night. She had to be stopped. He'd gotten separated from the mare as he'd searched the halls nearest the gardens, but spotted her again near the atrium set aside for the dance floor, like a well-oiled machine, like partners who'd been working together for years rather than just the evening. She held the door open so he didn't even have to slow down. She followed him in, his eyes scanned the crowd, and... She was yelling at him. What had happened? His hooves were shaking. He felt weak. He could barely breathe. He only felt like that when... Ah, right. Reflexes had taken over. Adrenaline fatigue. He'd reacted to the threat without fully processing it. If he'd been hit by that cake... It might have destroyed the entire room, along with everyone in it. She was still yelling at him. No, she was... Coming closer? Blue Blood danced backwards, desperate to not let any of the highly reactive cake touch him. Mind reeling from an evening of poison, the near miss with death, the adrenaline rush and the currently swiftly advancing death, Blue Blood finally got flummoxed and said the first thing that came to mind. Ew! Uh, st- uh, stay back! I just had myself groomed! It wasn't code. He just had to say something to buy himself some time. Afraid to get dirty? Was the last thing he heard before frosting hit him and felt like fire. Do you have anything else to report? The princess looked over the file before her and at the stallion in the hospital bed. No, your highness. Blue blood hurt all over, but had been told that he'd make a full recovery. He shifted, more uncomfortable about what he was going to ask than any mere physical pain. Er, may I ask something, though, your highness? Of course. She smiled at him as if they actually were aunt and nephew, and it felt better than all the painkillers the hospital could offer. What happened next? I know I failed the mission, but was anything salvaged? No one got hurt, did they? Celestia closed her eye and let out a small laugh. Actually, the mission was a success. A few ponies got hurt, but not from anything you failed to do. Aside from missing your contact at the very beginning, everything went about as well as could have been hoped for. I... what? If I wasn't supposed to have met the other agent, who was I supposed to meet? A little unicorn by the name of hors d'oeuvres. What? Apparently she'd gotten in touch with the agency a day ago and declared that she was going to turn herself in. She'd had an epiphany, wished to see justice done, and would hand herself over to our custody that very evening. However, she'd only do it at the gala, though, and refused to negotiate on that point. It was arranged that she'd meet with an agent there. That would be you, and they would assess whether she needed to be escorted or subdued. She had plans of her own, though. She intended to slip you the poisoned rose, then give you some cake in the middle of the biggest, most public event in Canterlot of the year. What happened after I got a face full of frosting, then? She didn't escape, did she? No, we managed to capture her in the end, with a bit of luck. Immediately after you were hit, a series of small but harmless catastrophes occurred. There was some property damage, some panic, all sounding much worse than it was. I arrived at that point and saw you, dazed and covered in cake. Having been informed on the mission earlier, I was able to make some deductions and took over the operation. I teleported you to the infirmary, secured the area, and scryed the nearby grounds. I found a white unicorn sitting on top of a nearby hill, cackling about how she'd shown them. Finally shown them all. I had a few words with her at that point. The princess paused to sip her tea. Blue Blood rested on the pillows and shook his head. 
Just like that, everything had been resolved better than he could have hoped for. A thought still bothered him, though. If hors d'oeuvres was the rarity I was supposed to meet, who did I spend the evening with? Celestia's smile shifted slightly, but Blue Blood wasn't sure what the new one meant. Rarity. I know who's ever in charge of assigning code names needs a vacation. They're getting a bit over the top with some of them. If you ask me, next thing we know it'll be nothing but Operation Shadow Explosion this and Codename Diamond Head that. Oh, that wasn't a question. It was an answer. You spent the night with Rarity. The Rarity? His eye twitched. As far as I know, that's the only one, yes. The Element of Generosity? One of the National Heroes of Equestria? That Rarity? He could hear the heart monitor beeping much faster now. Indeed. Maybe it would have been better if I had exploded after all. The princess laughed at that and nuzzled her nephew. It's not nearly so bad as you fear. With how much excitement the elements have been facing, and how she handled herself at the gala, I was thinking of inviting Rarity to join our little circle of friends. Once she hears about your work, your real work, I'm sure she'll be much more understanding of how the gala went. Blue Blood could only massage his aching head and hope the princess was right. She usually was, after all. They talked for a while more, before some nebulous matters of state demanded the princess return to court. At the last moment, she paused at the door and turned. Oh, by the way, it turns out that hors d'oeuvre's name is actually Garden Wishes. Blue Blood blinked at that bit of news. Wishes? Like Archduchess Whistle? No relation, but yes. An interesting coincidence, don't you agree? Blue Blood molded over. After all the plots and coincidences of last night, what was in a name? Situation number three. Chaotic cop-out. Prince Blueblood carefully adjusted his bow tie, making sure it was just right. Getting ready for the gala tonight, hmm? Absolutely. I love going every year, meeting new ponies, mingling, sharing stories, the music, the food. Oh, I can't wait to see all my old friends. Blueblood stamped his hooves in excitement. Only a little, though, since he had to maintain a certain level of royal dignity. Hmm, hmm, yes. So everyone will be there. Everyone you like. Everyone you know. Everyone you want to impress and make friends with. Indeed. Why, I've heard from Auntie that the bears of the Elements of Harmony will be making an appearance. I can't wait to thank them for everything they've done for Equestria. Blue Blood squinted and carefully smoothed down a stray hair in his mane. Really? Oh, that'll make this even better. I know. Actual, honest-to-goodness national heroes. Oh, I'll hope they'll let me hang out. Hang on. Who are you? Blue Blood finally turned from his mirror as it dawned on him that there shouldn't be anyone else in his room. He didn't normally make a habit of inviting ponies to watch him get ready for a party, after all. And what are you doing in my... Ah! Towering over the poor prince was an impossibility. Impossible for what it was, and impossible for what it meant. A mishmash of body parts. Mammal. Avian. Reptile. No. No. Statue. The kingdom. You, 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 your discord. How did you get free? Oh, don't get your cravat in a curl, Princelington. I'm not getting out of my little stone away from stone for another four months. Fun fact, though, with my official Chaos membership card, if I keep one foot back where I've been set free, I can poke my nose in at any time I want. It's a little hard to balance, though. The currently three-legged Draconiquus hopped towards the cowering unicorn and grinned. Like I said, don't worry. I'm not going to be here for long. I'm going to do you a favor. I'm going to make you and this gala remembered for the rest of history. Blue Blood stared up at Discord in terror. 
He'd studied history. He knew the sorts of things that got remembered the longest. Please, please no. I don't want to be a monster. I don't want to be responsible for the bloodiest night ever. No! Discord rolled his eyes and blew a raspberry. Then he blew a bubble. Then he blew a fuse. Once the lights came back on, he reached down and twirled the prince's bow tie. Well, I'm not going to turn you into a monster. No, 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 no. A brief look of hope flashed across Blue Blood's face. I'm going to do much worse than that. Blue Blood cringed as Discord's smile stretched even wider. I'm going to turn you into a jerk. Wait, what? A jerk, a snob, a bore, a rude, priggish, stuck-up meanie head. Oh, they'll be cursing your name until the cows come home. For a split second, unworldly voices could be heard chanting, Ya ya mutudan, ya ya mutudan. Blue Blood could hardly believe his luck. The old stories had mentioned that Discord was by definition unpredictable and so sometimes his rewards were worse than his punishments, and vice versa. But, really? I'm not going to grow fangs or claws or hurt anyone. I'm just going to be impolite? Discord nodded his head so quickly it flew off and ricocheted around the room before landing back on his neck. Yep. And for that, you'll be remembered as the greatest monster to ever blight the face of Equestria. And don't think you can make excuses by claiming, Oh no, Discord made me do it either. After all, I'm still a statue out there, you know. No one would believe you. Blue Blood exhaled in relief. <sighs> and wiped some sweat from his brow. And Discord noticed. Wait, do you think I'm letting you off easy? That I'm exaggerating? I'm completely serious. I've had a chance to look around. And you know what I've seen? Sympathy. Compassion. And endless understanding. Everyone is forgiven. And everyone is befriended. Discord started counting off on his fingers. Insane goddesses who tried to take over the kingdom. Insane love-eating bugs who tried to take over the kingdom. Insane mares who find evil artifacts and try to take over a town. Insane con artists who try to take over a farm. Insane diamond dogs who tried to kidnap a pony. Insane dragons who hit puberty and tried to kidnap a pony. Insane dragons who'd want to live near you little squirts. Insane little squirts who were bullying other little squirts. Fun-loving and wacky draconiquai who were just stretching their legs. Discord paused, counted his fingers again and shook his paw to get rid of the extras. I probably shouldn't know about a few of those, but eh, whatever. Discord shrugged and poked Blue Blood in the head, causing the unicorn to go cross-eyed. The point is, no matter what nasty thing any of us does, no matter the scale, there is some pony out there willing to give us the benefit of the doubt, to sympathize and love us, who can see things from our point of view, to give us the chance to explain and say, we're sorry. A wicked grin flitted across Discord's face and out the window. But not you. You'll never get that chance. You're going to do something far, far worse than hurt anyone. Or take over the kingdom. Or betray your loved ones or abuse and manipulate those around you for your own amusement. You will be despised and shunned for the unforgivable crime of not living up to someone else's expectations. After all, you never get a second chance to make a first impression. Although it wasn't his usual style, Discord used a light touch and, ugh, restraint. Not a full personality overhaul, just a low power tweaking. Not even enough to wash out the colors of his mane. Discord stuck out his tongue and squinted in concentration, making sure all the mental furniture was where he wanted it. Hmm, maybe a little more entitled. A little less empathetic. Ooh, alliterative. I like it. A dash of cowardice to round out the evening. Oh, and why not? Irrational fear of cakes. Flying cakes. Ideal. 
with a quick ruffle of his mane. Discord shooed the dazed prince out of his room. Go get him, slugger! Discord wiped a tear from his eyes. Uh, they grow up so fast. Discord looked around the small room, whistled a few bars of some pretty old song, and checked his watch. Well, I suppose I should get back to the maze, see how Sparkle and her friends are doing. Can't expect a leg to do the work of an entire Draconiquis, after all. A snap of his claws, a flash of light, a whiff of cinnamon, and the spirit of chaos was gone. <laughs>